Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be going through the whole of Edexcel GCC Chemistry Chemical Changes. So we start off looking at acids and alkalis, and then move on to electrolysis. If you'd like to follow along with this video, over on my website you can download my notes. Okay, so this is the pH scale, and this shows how acidic or alkaline a substance is. So anything with a pH from 0 to 6 is acidic, and then from 8 to 14 is alkaline. Now pH 7 is neutral, so this is normally water. Now before we start looking in depth for acids and alkalis, the first thing you need to know is that alkalis are soluble bases, and the base is just a chemical that can neutralise an acid. So when they dissolve, acids and alkalis split up into ions. So let's use hydrochloric acid as an example. This will split up into H plus ions and Cl minus ions. Now we don't really care about the Cl minus ions at the moment, the really important thing is that all acids, when they dissolve, will split up into hydrogen plus ions, so H plus ions. Now, alkalis also split up into ions, but they don't form H plus ions, they form hydroxide ions. So let's use sodium hydroxide as an example. So this will split up into our positive sodium ions and our negative hydroxide ions. Now again, we don't really care about the Na plus ions at the moment. You really need to know that alkalis split up into hydroxide ions, so OH minus ions. Now, this process of splitting up into their ions is called dissociation. Now, acids and alkalis can be strong or weak, and this depends on how well they split up into their ions. So, strong acid or alkali will dissociate completely, so all of the molecules will split up into their ions, whereas weak ones only partially dissociate. So not all of the molecules split up into their ions. Some of them are just quite happy staying as molecules. Now, weak acids can be reversible, so they can change between being dissociated and being together. So we can use this reversible arrow to show that they constantly change in between being dissociated and being together as a molecule. Now, something with a neutral pH just means it has equal concentrations of H plus and OH minus ions, so they're completely balanced, it's neutral. Now, as well as being strong or weak, acid and alkalis can also be concentrated or dilute. Now, concentration just means how spread out or close together things are. Something that is concentrated will have a lot of the substance with only a small amount of the thing it's dissolved in, whereas something that is dilute will have only a small amount of the substance compared to a lot of the thing it's dissolved in. So this can mean that sometimes a concentrated weak acid can have a higher pH than a dilute strong acid. Now you need to know some of the common acids and alkalis that could come up in the exam. So the first acid you need to know is hydrochloric acid, which is HCl. And then we have nitric acid, which is HNO3. And then sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4. The bases that you need to know are then sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH, potassium hydroxide, which is KOH, and then calcium hydroxide, which is Ca, and then OH in brackets, and then 2. So these are the common acids and the bases you need to know. And remember that a base is just the opposite of an acid, whereas an alkali is a soluble base. Now to test if something is an acid or an alkali, we can use indicators. So there are four main indicators that we use, methyl orange, phenolphthalein, red litmus paper, and blue litmus paper. We can also use universal indicator, which is the one you're probably familiar with, where you dip it in the sample, the colour of the paper will turn the colour of the pH scale. So methyl orange will turn red in an acid, and it will turn yellow in something that is neutral and in an alkali. Phenolphthalein will go colourless in an acid and in something neutral, but in an alkali it will go this bright pink colour. Red litmus paper will stay red in an acid and in something that's neutral, but in an alkali it will turn blue. And then blue litmus paper will turn red in an acid, but will stay blue in something that is neutral and an alkali. Now we can also test for different gases. So to test for hydrogen, we can hold a lit splint over the sample. And if hydrogen is present, you'll hear a squeaky pop. To test for carbon dioxide, we can bubble the gas through lime water. And if carbon dioxide is present, it will go cloudy. And then to test for oxygen, we can hold a glowing splint over it. And if oxygen is present, it will relight. 
Now if we react an acid and base together, they neutralise each other. So we get something that has a pH of 7. So we know that acids dissociate into hydrogen ions, and that bases dissociate into hydroxide ions, and that something neutral is usually water. So water is H2O. Now over here we've got one hydrogen, another hydrogen, and oxygen. So over here we've got H2O. So when we react an acid and base together, we get something that is neutral. So there's a couple of different acid reactions that you need to know. So if we react an acid with a metal oxide or hydroxide, we'll get a salt plus water. If we mix an acid with just the normal metal, we'll get salt and hydrogen. And then if we react an acid with a metal carbonate, we get salt, water and carbon dioxide. So I've used this word salt quite a lot. And this is just the product that acids and bases form. So at the start of the video, we said that acids dissociate into hydrogen ions and alkalis dissociate into hydroxide ions. And we scribbled out the other ions that they dissociate into. So we scribbled out the chloride ions and the sodium ions. Now these salts are formed when these two ions come together. So the ions that we scribbled out come together. So if we had hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide, we end up with our salt and then water. So this salt is going to be sodium chloride. And this is because we know that we need the H plus ions and the OH minus for the water. So the first part of the salt comes from the acid and the second part of the salt comes from the base. So it's just what's left. So we have our sodium chloride, NaCl. Now these salts that are formed can be soluble or insoluble. So something that is soluble dissolves, and something that is insoluble doesn't dissolve. So all nitrates are soluble. So if the salt ends in nitrate, it will be soluble. Most chlorides are also soluble. And this is apart from silver and lead chlorides. So silver chloride and lead chloride does not dissolve. And then most sulfates are also soluble. And this is apart from lead sulfate, barium sulfate and calcium sulfate. Most carbonates and most hydroxides are then also insoluble. So a salt that is really useful is copper sulfate. But copper sulfate doesn't really exist naturally in the world. But copper oxide does. So we can make copper sulfate by reacting copper oxide with sulfuric acid. So this is how we can create copper sulfate. Now when we do this reaction, we need to make sure we add excess of this copper oxide. Now this is to make sure that all of the sulfuric acid is reacted with the copper oxide. If we don't add quite enough, then all of the acid won't be reacted and it won't be very successful. If we add more than we need, so excess, it will mean all of the acid is reacted. And then we can use filtration to get rid of the unreacted copper oxide. Now you see that we also form water when we create this copper sulfate. So then we can carry out crystallisation to get pure copper sulfate crystals which are bright blue. So you also need to know what the symbol equation looks like for this reaction. So you have CuO at H2SO4 creates CuSO4 and H2O. Now sometimes we need to carry out a titration. And this controls the exact amount of the thing we're adding. So when we just made copper sulfate, we could add excess copper oxide. And this is because copper oxide is insoluble. It's really easy to just filter out all of the unreacted copper oxide. But if this was soluble, it's a lot more difficult. We have to use a titration. So we carry out a titration when everything is soluble. So the main bit of equipment we need is a burette. And we fill the burette with the acid or base that we're trying to measure. And then in this flask at the bottom here, we have the thing we're reacting it with and an indicator. Now this tap on the burette helps us control how many drops we're adding. So the idea is that we gradually add drops one by one into this flask and then it reacts with the chemical in there and then the indicator tells us once they are both fully reacted. So this means we don't have to filter off any other excess reactant, we get the right amount. Now once you've done this a couple of times with the indicator,
You can memorize how many drops are needed and then do it without the indicator interfering with the reaction. So the next thing we're going to look at is electrolysis. So let's break down the word of electrolysis to, to see what it means. So it starts with electro, and this means electricity. And then we have a lysis, and this means to split up. So it suggests that we're going to be splitting things up with electricity. And the thing we're going to be splitting up is ionic compounds. So ionic compounds are made of cations, which are positive, and anions, which are negative. So let's look at the setup of electrolysis. We have two electrodes. We have the anode, which is positive, and the cathode, which is negative. And these are powered by a battery. And these electrodes stick into an electrolyte. And this is the ionic compound. And this electrolyte has to be molten or dissolved. And this is so that the ions can move. Now the idea behind electrolysis is that the positive ions move to the cathode, and the negative ions move to the anode, so opposites attract. The positive go to the negative, and the negative go to the positive. So we separate the ions out. Now during electrolysis, ions turn into atoms. So to turn into atoms, they either need to gain or lose electrons. So oxidation is the loss of electrons, and this happens at the anode as the negative ions need to lose some electrons to become normal atoms again. And then reduction is the gain of electrons. And this happens at the cathode, as the positive ions need to gain electrons to become atoms again. Now we can remember this by using oil rig, which stands for oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So if the electrolyte is molten, it's pretty straightforward, nothing else happens. But if the electrolyte is dissolved, it's a little bit more complicated. We have more ions involved. So if it's dissolved in water, we have H plus ions and OH minus ions. Now, if we have sodium chloride dissolved in water, we have Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. So the positive ions go to the cathode and the negative ions go to the anode. Now, the less reactive ion is going to be given off. And this is because the more reactive ions are pretty happy staying as ions, but the less reactive ones want to go back to atoms. So hydrogen is much more reactive than sodium, so hydrogen is going to be given off. But chlorine is much more reactive than the hydroxide ion, so chlorine is given off. So we will produce hydrogen and chlorine. Now we can write half equations to tell the story of what happens to each ion during the reaction. So let's write hydrogen's half equation. We start with H plus ions. Now to become atoms again, the hydrogen ion needs to gain an electron. So it gains one electron, so we say E minus. And then this forms hydrogen. Now hydrogen doesn't just exist on its own. Hydrogen is diatomic, so we need to say H2. So this means we need to gain two electrons and we start with two hydrogen ions. Now we can do the same for chlorine. So we start with Cl minus ions, and then they travel to the anode. Now this gives off some of their electrons and creates chlorine gas. Now again, chlorine is diatomic, so we need to add a 2, which means it gives off 2 electrons, and we start with 2 chlorine ions. If this video helped with your chemistry revision, please subscribe to my channel and check out the other videos I have.